What's up, guys? Many of you have probably heard that the NCAA and the Power Five conferences have agreed on a settlement that enables colleges to pay athletes for the first time ever. This is the most significant change that we have ever seen in collegiate athletics. For example, as part of the settlement, the NCAA and the Power Five conferences have agreed to pay $2.7 billion in damages and back pay to thousands of former college athletes, ultimately removing the liability of several other class action lawsuits that they were facing too. But more importantly, the NCAA settlement really does two things. Number one, it creates a potentially sustainable framework for the future based on revenue sharing, similar to what you would see with a salary cap. And number two, it prohibits athletes from striking compensation deals with boosters, like we see today. Now, there are still many details to figure out, but early signs indicate that each school in a Power 5 conference will be able to pay up to $20 million to its student-athletes starting in 2025. Now, schools will be able to manage their balance sheets as they deem fit, with money potentially coming from conference distributions or maybe booster donations or even private equity. But the overall concept is that compensation will now come directly from the school, not collectives, which should theoretically even the playing field a little bit more than it is today. That doesn't mean collectives will go away though, of course. A few schools have already started the process of transitioning their collectives into what we're now calling marketing agencies, with the idea being that these marketing agencies would be funded both by boosters and the university. These agencies will then source, negotiate, and process NIL deals for the school's athletes, ultimately allowing the university to circumvent the salary cap by funneling non-salary cap money to athletes through payments to the agency. This sort of creates a gray area that schools will almost certainly try to challenge. However, I would argue that payments coming from the school are still cleaner than many of the today's collectives. And the more significant question currently outstanding is if and how Title IX would be incorporated. Title IX, of course, is the federal law prohibiting sex-based discrimination in college sports, i.e. there needs to be a women's team for every men's team, even if that women's team then loses money. Now, to be clear, this law isn't going to go away. But Fox Sports' Joel Klatt says that several athletic directors have already warned him that they will be forced to cut programs if the NCAA's new $20 million salary cap structure is uniformly applied across all sports. This is a point of contention because while Title IX has created equal opportunity in college sports, regardless of gender, football and basketball programs are typically the only college sports teams that consistently produce a profit. And it would be nonsensical to pay a school starting quarterback the same money as the captain of the golf team. Joel Klatt said, we basically have three revenue sports in the college game. Football, which brings in about 70 to 75% of all revenue in each athletic department across the country. Men's basketball, namely the NCAA tournament. And women's basketball, with the growth of the NCAA tournament in that sport as well. That's why the more likely outcome, in my opinion, is that the NCAA eventually tries to get a federal carve-out for nonprofit generating sports. They, of course, will argue that the success of these programs is what allows all the other programs to operate at a loss. And my expectation is that if this doesn't get approved, we'll eventually see another class action lawsuit anyway with college football players arguing that they aren't receiving their fair share of broadcasting revenues because they have to share it with others. However, even with these unanswered questions, this settlement was still a no-brainer for the NCAA. Going to trial could have cost them several billion dollars more. This model is a major step in the right direction, too, as payments will be coming directly from the school, and NIL will now be what it was initially intended to be, an opportunity for athletes to earn extra income based on deals for their name, image, and likeness. Don't get me wrong, this doesn't totally even the playing field. Bigger schools with complex collectives will still have an advantage because they will inherently be able to provide athletes with more marketing opportunities. Think about it this way. The starting quarterback at Alabama is obviously more marketable than the starting quarterback at UCF. No disrespect to UCF. But with that dynamic, it also exists today in professional sports with big and small market teams. Instead, the more interesting angle to me is how universities will decide to fund these programs. We all know there is more than enough money in college sports, mainly football and basketball, to pay players what they are worth. But something tells me schools will try to get creative in an effort to maintain as much profitability as possible, potentially even working with private equity funds to raise cheaper capital. The best example of this is the recently announced College Sports Fund by Redbird Capital Partners and Weatherford Capital. This joint venture plans to provide athletic departments with $50 million to $200 million in capital. However, since there is no real exit or opportunity for liquidity, typically the real payday on a private equity investment, schools will only have to pay a royalty on new revenue generation. Private equity has a reputation for messing things up, aggressively cutting costs, and selling off the most profitable parts of a business. However, that doesn't really apply with college sports. This is sort of a unique structure. Think of it more similar to private credit. And I imagine there are at least a few universities that will be swayed by large cash payouts. Regardless, college sports have always operated on a uniquely flawed model. I, along with many others, have consistently discussed the possibility that college athletes would one day be paid directly by the schools or conferences 
that they play for. We still have a long way to go before I consider the job done, as current payouts account for just over 20% of total athletic department revenue, which is a far cry from the near 50-50 split that most professional sports leagues operate on today. Regardless, we are moving in the right direction though. The current model of annual free agency via the transfer portal, coinciding with backdoor deals negotiated by wealthy boosters, was obviously unsustainable, as evidenced by player lawsuits and coaches quitting. That doesn't mean everything will be perfect, but at least, this now feels like a more fair and equitable option for the players, regardless of whether the NCAA likes it. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to the channel. I make videos every single week breaking down the most interesting stories in sports business.